Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. It's your favorite estate planning attorney, Paul Rabelais here. Another action-packed live stream for, uh, for you to enjoy. Six revocable living trust mistakes. So I'm Paul Rabelais. I'm an estate planning attorney, uh, founded a national estate planning law firm, America's Estate Planning Lawyers. More information on that in the description below. You even can request a time to chat with me about designing your estate plan. Enough on that. Let's get right into it. So wanted to really give you kind of the, the practical six mistakes that people make when they create their living trust estate planning program. So the reason I need to need to have a live stream like this is because just like any other project, anything else that you undertake in your lifetime, it's it's possible that mistakes could get made especially in estate planning, since so many people are involved with the settlement. There's tax laws, there's property stuff, there's financial stuff. Um, so, so many so many different pieces to the estate planning puzzle. So let me just start with the basics and then I'll jump right into some of the mistakes. And oh, by the way, hello, Larry, MVP Larry. Looks like we've got New Jersey. We've got a couple of North Carolinas. Jimbo actually got your email. And so, yeah, I'm all over that. Um, somebody I've been talking to and emailing um, about their own family situation. So good to see you on the call. And made it with her uh, happy hands. Uh, for some reason, that always cracks me up. All right. Um, so you got some questions already going on in there. Um, the way I do it, present some information, head to the chat, go through the chat respond to the ones that are appropriate. And quite frankly, with my history of live streams, almost every comment seems to be appropriate. It's either a good point, somebody sharing an experience or a really good question. So we'll hit that uh, in just a little bit when we get through the material. So the idea, the, the basics of living trust estate planning, let's hit the basics before we get into some of the mistakes that get made. The basics are, Yes, in general, people want to, if they can, simplify the uh, the transfer of what they've accumulated during their lifetime to their closest loved ones. They want to make it easy for others. They want to avoid taxes. They want to avoid government interference. They want to keep things in the family. Those are common goals of estate planning. So the the traditional, maybe old fashioned way to do it is people create their will. In their will, they name their executor who's going to handle the estate when they die. They name their heirs. I leave $10,000 to the church, $20,000 to my friend, and the rest of my estate to be divided among my children equally. If any of my children die before me, I leave that child's share to that child's children. Typical things you see in a in a will, that's the kind of traditional way it's been done. You leave everything in your name, but when you pass away, your assets are frozen and the executor of your will has to get your original will, work with the lawyers. The lawyers typically prepare court pleadings in order to have a judge declare that the will is valid in order to confirm that the executor has the power to manage assets while the estate is being settled. Ultimately, court pleadings are prepared, asset and debt inventories are filed at the courthouse. Ultimately, a judge signs a court order ordering that estate assets be transferred to the appropriate heirs and the appropriate proportion. So all that's a court and attorney involved process. So some people, and many, many people have gone through that before. Um, for for some Sometimes it, it is easy Sometimes it's it's a nightmare. So quite frankly, love to hear from you. If you've had a probate experience in the past, simple or nightmarish difficult, throw it in the chat just so everybody can learn from everybody other's experiences. Um, so, but nonetheless, there there is the possibility, there is there is the the distinct possibility and kind of likelihood that that court and attorney involved proceeding is is going to take longer than people like. It's going to be expensive because you're paying the courts, you're paying lawyers, and people just perceive it as an all-around hassle. So what some people do, what many people do, is in, instead of using their kind of will as the integral part of their estate plan that dictates who handles things when they die, who are the heirs, who's going to inherit, 
Instead, they create their, what I'll call revocable living trust. I'll go back to my typical example. You've heard me say it. I hope you're not getting tired of it. Fred and Wilma Flintstone set up the Fred and Wilma Flintstone Living Trust. Could be called a number of different things, but let's say we called it the Fred and Wilma Flintstone Living Trust. And because things, and in their trust, they designated who's going to handle the trust when they die, who are the beneficiaries of the trust to inherit from Fred and Wilma. And the whole idea behind the Living Trust is transfer those assets that are in your name, like your home, like your brokerage account, like your business, transfer it from, you know, it, it may it may be at the time that you set that us, this up, it may be titled in the name of Fred and Wilma Flintstone. But that the fact that it's titled in the name of Fred and Wilma Flintstone means it's going to have to go through all the probate stuff. So the idea is transfer it from Fred and Wilma Flintstone to Fred and Wilma Flintstone as trustees of the Fred and Wilma Flintstone Trust. Things that are in a trust when someone passes away, they don't get frozen. They don't have to go through the probate process. Um, Fred and Wilma, in their trust, they'll name instead of an executor like you name in a will, you name a successor trustee to handle the trust when you pass away and distribute the trust assets in accordance with the provisions and the trust instrument. So the, whole, the, the the overwhelming main reason people create these revocable living trust is to just bypass or eliminate the court and attorney involved probate process. Sometimes our attorneys involved in the trust settlement, sometimes, not every time. We'll get to some of that here in the in, in the live stream here this evening. But I've I've been involved with many, many families where we where we created the living trust and and moved you know moved assets into the living trust, and then maybe I hear months or years or decades later that the person who set up the trust died, and I I, I never got a call or or I get the call after you know everything's transferred out of the trust to the children by that successor trustee, maybe one of the adult children, and 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 so there's no attorney involvement in many cases in those trust settlements. Okay, so should sound easy enough. What in the world kind of could go wrong with, with people doing that? <laughs> well, there are, you know, uh, of the probably millions of living trusts created in America or maybe even around the world, um, there there've been a few mistakes made and it's likely that mistakes will continue to be made. So hopefully, um, you can listen up and I can share with you some of the common mistakes that people make when they set up their living trust based estate plan and make sure that you don't make those mistakes. That's the whole idea here. All I'm trying to do is educate as many people as we can, get people to make informed decisions, get people to be a little bit proactive and make this whole process easy for themselves and their family. So let's jump right in. Mistake number one that people make when they create a, create their living trust program. It's it's the one that everybody says. It's kind of the obvious one, but uh, I, I don't want to state just the obvious ones in this live stream. I want to I want to hit the ones that are kind of practical, but maybe you don't hear about them as much. So, but but I got to start with the obvious one. The obvious one is, or obvious to many at least, the obvious one is, yeah, you didn't transfer your assets to your trust. So some people mistakenly believe if I just have a living trust when I die, if I signed a living trust and put it into effect, then there won't be any probate. And so that's a false assumption. So in order to avoid the probate, not only do you have to create your living trust because things in a trust do avoid the probate, but you have to transfer those assets that are in your name. And, and it's often done at the same time that you create your trust or very shortly thereafter, if you perhaps have to go deal with your financial institutions in order to transfer things to your trust. So it is really important that um, people do transfer their, their real estate to their trust, their business interests to their trust. Many people transfer their bank accounts to their trust. More on bank accounts and another mistake their vehicles, their, their stock that they own outside of their retirement accounts. Now, if they own stock inside of an IRA or a 401k, that doesn't get transferred to their trust because even if someone has a living trust, they'll, they'll keep ownership of their IRA and 401k in their name. 
because those assets you're permitted to, to designate beneficiaries. So if Fred Flintstone dies with an IRA uh, and he named Wilma as his 100% primary beneficiary, then Wilma's going to get Fred's death certificate. She's going to go to the financial institution where the IRA is held and they'll move that IRA from Fred's name into Wilma's name. No courts, no lawyers, no judges are needed for that. So typically people do pass away with some probate assets and some non-probate assets like IRAs, 401ks, life insurance that have beneficiaries. So it's those probate assets that would have to go through probate if they were in your name when you died. You want to make sure during your lifetime you, you transfer those assets to your trust. Likewise, if you create your trust, you transfer assets to your trust and you go buy a new home or a new piece of property or you open up a new brokerage account or maybe even buy a new vehicle, when you acquire new things after forming your trust, you want to make sure you acquire those assets or open those accounts in the name of your trust. So when Fred and Wilma, they did their trust seven years ago, but they're going to go buy a new home, they tell all the people who are handling the closing when they purchase the property, hey, don't I don't want to buy it in my name. I want to buy it in the name of my trust. And so when they sign the paperwork, they own it as Fred and Wilma, as trustees of the Fred and Wilma Trust, just like if they went to a brokerage firm and opened up a new brokerage account. Hey, Fred says, don't put that in my name because it'll be frozen when I die. It'll have to go through probate. I want to open my account in the name of my trust. And Fred gives them the name of the trust. So the, the financial institution opens the account in the name of Fred and Wilma as trustees of the Fred and Wilma Trust. So mistake number one, not retitling those assets or, or that's also referred to as not funding your trust. Funding your trust and, <clears throat> and changing the title of assets that are in your name to your trust really is the same thing. So that's mistake number one. And, and the, the, the consequences of making that mistake are if Fred and Wilma create their living trust and if when Fred dies, he has a stock account, maybe he owns some stock in a computer share account, or maybe he has a brokerage account at Fidelity or Schwab or Vanguard or anyone, a, a number of these places, those accounts are, are going to be frozen and no one can access them until they use Fred's what's called pour over will and go through the probate process to get those assets poured over into Fred's trust. Okay, so that's number one. Number two, mistake number two is all about what I'll call the, the trustee designation. The concern is someone may set up their living trust when they're 50 years old and they die when they're 95. So that's 45 years laps, lapsing between the time they set up their trust and the time that they pass away. So just like in a will where you name an executor to handle things when you pass away, if you set up a living trust, you're the trustee, Fred and Wilma, in their trust. They said the initial trustees are Fred and Wilma, so they can manage everything for the rest of their lifetime. Probably even says when Fred dies, Wilma's the sole trustee. But it says after Fred and Wilma die, the successor or the first successor trustee is blank. So it, the whole trustee discussion, it, it goes really beyond just who's the person you'd want to handle things if you both pass away. Because again, they may be handling things 40 or 50 years from now. So you have to have various contingencies in place um, because circumstances 40 years after you set this up, might be different. So let's talk about some of the successor trustee designation decisions that you have. One is, are you designating a single trustee or multiple co-trustees? A lot of parents will say, well, we got three kids. So-and-so is the oldest. He's, he's responsible. He handles money well. Let's make him the trustee. And that's okay. Some people say, well, you know, I don't want to, uh, I have two children and I really don't want to show partiality. So let's make both of them successor co-trustees when we pass away. And that's okay too. And But I do have a concern and maybe it will be changed in the next 40 or 50 years. But I've worked with a lot of financial institutions. Not a problem if you name two co-trustees and you pass away and your house needs to be sold and the 
two co-trustees can get together and sell the house. They both sign on the on uh, all on all the paperwork to get the house sold. When they sell it, there's a check payable to the trust that they'll deposit into a trust account for ultimate distribution to the trust beneficiaries. No problem there on real estate. No, no even problem if there's a business in your trust, an LLC interest. But those. Financial institutions, they all have different policies on who they will and who they won't work with. And many of them will just flat out tell you, if you pass away and you either have a will and name co-executors, or if you have a trust and name co-successor trustees, not, not going to work for us. We, we won't work with two people together on accounts who have to transact everything together. So maybe um, maybe you say, well, I appoint these two people, but but either one can act. Um, so that's a possibility. Be careful. Just be careful if you name co-trustees. You may even want to go to your financial institution and ask them, hey, I, I've got a trust. I named two, these two people as co-trustees. Is there going to be a problem when I pass away? Or I've I've uh, I named these two people as co-executors when they go to set up estate accounts. Is there going to be a problem? So um, so be aware of that. Sometimes people name a corporate trustee. I, I think that option is probably used, probably in my view, it, because it's not used very much. I've been handling uh, estates for 30 something years and a very small percentage of people have said, well, when I pass away, I want I want big corporate trustee to handle my estate. Sounds scary. Maybe it is scary. Maybe it sounds expensive. Maybe it is expensive. But um, I, I find far, you know, too many times um, uh, parents, for example, or settlers of living trusts will name an individual and then another individual as the backup to the first individual. Sometimes those people get in over their head with all of the tax consequences, the financial, the investment, the real estate. And so uh, it is it is possible for people to name corporate trustees. I think the corporate trustee fees are getting more reasonable than they were in the past. Um, but uh, they vary from corporate trustee to corporate trustee. Don't ask me what they are because they all vary. But maybe if somebody here on the live stream has had some experience with a corporate trustee, good, bad, or otherwise, throw it in the chat or throw it in a comment if you're watching a replay of this. We'd love to get your feedback and your experiences. And then there's there's a lot more to the trustee designation because what if what if the first successor trustee can't serve? And how do you define when they can't serve? Is it just if they're dead or if they're disabled or or they refuse to serve, then then what happens? Or what happens if you name a successor trustee and then a backup to that successor trustee? But what if 40 years later when you die, there's a complete vacancy in the office of the trustee? The trustee that you named isn't around or isn't willing. The backup that you named isn't around or isn't willing. Then unless you've provided for that, then everybody's going to court because if you have a trust and let's say you have a Schwab account, I'm not picking on Schwab. They're all, they're all the same when it comes to this. And you pass away, both successor trustees that you name aren't around. And then your beneficiaries go to Schwab with your trust instrument. Schwab's going to review the trust instrument. They want to know who they need to deal with. And so they're like, well, where's Pebbles? Pebbles is the first trustee and well, Pebbles dead. Well, Bam Bam's the next trustee. Where's Bam Bam? Bam Bam, Bam doesn't want to have anything to do with this. So then Schwab is going to say, we need a trustee to deal with. And because there was no provision in the trust stating what happens in the event there's a vacancy in the office of the trustee, you know, the beneficiaries are hiring lawyers, going to court. Um, maybe one of them steps up and asks a judge to appoint them as the trustee of this trust. You want to avoid all that court intervention. Same thing if you have a will and executor and none of the executors are willing or able to serve. So maybe you have a provision in the trust that says if there is a vacancy in the office of the trust, maybe if it's appropriate, a majority of the beneficiaries could designate a trust at that time. That keeps everything out of the courts. So um, when when you haven't provided for these reasonable contingencies of trustees, it just means it's likely that people are going to wind up in court um, having a judge create some um, 
some some revision to the trust or some appointment. So also kind of kind of what's what's involved if a trustee starts performing their job as the successor trustee, collecting all the money and what if they're not doing a very good job? What if uh, you know they're mishandling the money or they're just they're just not doing their job? What what would be involved in removing a trustee? Do you have to get solely a, a court involved to to get a trustee removed from his or her position? Or maybe do you want to say that all of the beneficiaries together unanimously can get together and remove a trustee if unanimously they all feel like that trustee you know isn't isn't doing their job? So more on the trust, is the trustee entitled to compensation or do you request maybe that an individual who you've named as the trustee serve without compensation? What are the trustee powers? Um, none of the old trusts say anything about, you know, the trustee can handle your digital assets because digi digital assets are relatively new. Do you want your trustee, if you're incapacitated, you set up a trust, you're incapacitated, but maybe it makes sense right before you die to make some gifts from your trust to your beneficiaries to avoid estate tax? Does, does the trustee have that power? Do you want the, the trustee, particularly maybe a trustee who is your child, do you want to permit them to do what I call some self-dealing? So if the house is supposed to go to four kids, but and you named one child as the trustee of your trust, do you want to expressly permit that trustee who is your child to purchase assets from the trust for fair value. Um, and so those are all, that's all part of this mistake. Number two is kind of messing up or inadequately handling the whole trustee designation. So that's number two. Number three is, and we'll probably see more and more of this in the future because it's kind of new, but not really is, is, um, over relying on TOD and POD designations instead of putting assets in a trust account. So the deal here is legislatures across the country, which I'm excited about, um, all allow for these TOD and POD designations. TOD stands for transfer on death. POD stands for payable on death. Generally speaking, banks have POD designation, bank accounts, checking savings. Stocks and brokerage firms have TOD, transfer on death de designations. And I'm here to say that generally that's a that's a good thing that POD and TOD designations are available because it it is an option for people to set up their accounts, leave their accounts in their name and allow for a transfer of that account when the account owner dies outside of probate. So generally, I think TOD and POD is a good thing. So what could go wrong? Well, you know, the the um, it's not a perfect system that we have. I, I will say trusts are better. Maybe I could say slightly better or a little better. Trusts are generally better for a couple of reasons to, to transfer that stock, transfer those bank accounts to your trust while you're alive. One reason for that is this incapacity planning if your assets are in your trust and you become incapable, then all the financial institutions and third parties, they're, they're pretty good at allowing the successor trustee to come in and handle those trust accounts when the settlor is alive but incapacitated. That, that typically works pretty well, as opposed to if you leave those checking, saving CDs, brokerage accounts, stock accounts, if you leave those in your name and rely on a TOD or POD to uh, transfer those assets to your beneficiaries when you pass away. But during your lifetime, you, you get to a point where you can't handle your money. You can't sign your name, dementia, Alzheimer's, whatever the case may be, illness or injury. Then now if somebody's going to handle your account during your incapacity, they'll have to rely on using your durable power of attorney, which you set up when you set up your living trust or set up your will or whatever. Financial institutions, they're getting a little better at it, but not much. They are reluctant to rely on powers of attorney um, 
because they're just scared to release the funds to someone else. They fear that your power of attorney may have been revoked. You may have changed your power of attorney. They don't like the wording of the power of attorney. They want their own power of attorney formed, form signed, and now you're incapacitated and you can't sign the financial institution's own power of attorney. So it's, it's, it's easier for the incapacity planning if you've transferred your financial accounts to your living trust versus leaving them in your name and relying on TOD and POD forms. Another concern I have about the TOD or POD forms is that they're really rigid. I've reviewed several TOD and POD forms from various financial institutions over the last few months. Many of them, they're just there's no flexibility. So maybe Fred Flintstone has has four kids and maybe each of his kids has three kids. So on the PO, or TOD or POD form that Fred signs, he says, yeah, I want this transferred to my four children equally when I pass away. And, uh, and what happens is, let's say, you know, again, this form stays in effect for 40 years. And during that time, unfortunately, one of Fred's children passes away and that deceased child has three children. Fred's trust uh, says Fred leaves his assets to his children. And if any of his children predecease him, then he leaves the child's share to the child's children, or just says Fred leaves his estate to his descendants per stirpes, which really means the same thing. But if you go back and look at the TOD form, the TOD form says if any of these named beneficiaries predeceases the account owner, then the financial institution will release the funds to the surviving TOD or POD beneficiaries. So real rigid, very little flexibility. And if you know Fred had a $4 million estate, then that million dollars that would have gone to his grandchildren from the deceased child, they, they don't get anything, which is not what Fred intended. That million dollars would go back to Fred's surviving children. Or, I mean, even in the unlikely event, you know, three of Fred's children died before him, the surviving TOD beneficiary would get the entire $4 million that Fred had as his children from his deceased children would get nothing. So again, the, the, the trust is more flexible than the not only who you leave things to, but some of the what ifs that need to be covered in estate planning, because when you create your estate plan, it's, it may be in effect for and hopefully will be in effect for decades and things happen in the interim. So what some people do, though, is uh, not a bad option, um, still incapacity problem issues, but not when I die issues is. You do leave your TOD or POD account in your name, but you name your trust as your beneficiary instead of naming your three children as on the TOD form. And if one dies, everything goes to the surviving children. Maybe that's not what you want. So you, you can name your trust as your TOD or POD beneficiary. So a few different options there. But that's number three is really over relying on TOD and POD beneficiaries. I, I like the fact that TODs and POD beneficiaries exist. Um, but everything just has to be, you know, used properly and, and know its place. All right. Mistake number four is all of the, I'm going to group these up into one mistake. Mistake number four is all of the false assumptions that people make about living trust. Now, I know nobody listening and, and watching this live stream will, will, will make these assumptions but boy, a lot of people in the past have made these assumptions incorrectly. I'm going to go through maybe four, five, six of them and lump them all into mistake number four, which is all of the false assumptions that people make. Number one is people assume that their revocable living trust needs a tax identification number when they set up. They say, Paul, uh, I don't think I want a living trust because trusts have to pay income tax at really high income tax rates. What they fail to realize is that when someone does set up a revocable living trust, it is for income tax purposes called a grantor trust. And so the trust doesn't need a tax ID number. The trust doesn't prepare any uh, tax returns. The trust doesn't owe any tax. When Fred goes to set up a trust account at the brokerage firm, and the brokerage firm needs a, a social security number or a tax ID number, 
the tax laws say use Fred's social security number as the tax identification number for his trust. That way all income that the trust produces just flows through the trust and Fred reports that on his personal income tax return. So moving assets into or out of a living trust has really zero positive or negative effect on Fred and Wilma's income tax because all that income just flow, continues to flow through to his personal return. So while Fred and Fred is alive, there's no tax identification number that's necessary. Another false assumption is assuming that the revocable living trust assets are excluded from Fred's and Wilma's estate for federal estate tax purposes. Doesn't affect many people anyway. The estate tax exclusion amount, if people die in 2024, is $13.61 million. If you're married, each spouse gets an exemption. $27.2 million of assets is exempt from the 40% federal estate tax. So it's really not, doesn't affect many people. But some people mistakenly assume that, okay, I've got these assets in my name and I'm going to move them to my living trust. Yep, they'll avoid probate when I pass away. But I love the fact that if I move these into my living trust, they won't be in my estate anymore for federal estate tax purposes. That's just a false assumption. Generally, since you can do whatever you want to with your living trust assets, they're still included in your estate. The beauty of that, though, is they because they're in your estate for estate tax purposes, it's not likely there's going to be estate tax due, but there will be a step up in basis on those assets when you pass away because they are in your estate. So, so in many cases, having those assets in your estate is a good thing because the heirs get to take advantage of the step up in basis. So another a false assumption people make is they assume that the assets in their revocable living trust are, are not or, or are no longer countable resources for purposes of long-term care Medicaid eligibility if they go into the nursing home. They'll say something like, wow, I've got, I'm moving these $400,000 of, of accounts. I'm moving them into my living trust. If I go into the nursing home, I don't have much left in my name. So I have all those $400,000 of assets protected if I go into a nursing home in five years, 10 years, 15 years, whatever. False assumption there. So all of the Medicaid rules say, and every state says, if you have assets in your, whether they're in your name or in your revocable living trust, they are a countable resource for Medicaid eligibility purposes. Yeah, I've made some other live streams about a very particular type of irrevocable trust that you could transfer assets to when it's appropriate um, and start the five-year look-back period or whatever your state's look-back period is for, for kind of protecting those assets. If you go into a nursing home, that's another story. But assuming that moving assets to your revocable living trust is somehow protecting them from Nursing home poverty or nursing home expenses, false assumption. Another false assumption is moving assets to your revocable living trust offers you some additional lawsuit or creditor protection. Again, this whole living trust plan, look, you're in control. The You're, you're putting things into a trust in order to, to get them out of your name for probate purposes when you pass away and to simplify the settlement when you die. That is far and away the number one reason people create living trusts and transfer at, uh, assets to it. There's not even a close second rule there. So that's the primary reason they do it. Yes, if you have a bank account and you have a million dollars in it and it's either and it's either in your name or it's in your re revocable living trust, is it subject to your creditors? Yeah, it is. How many people get their bank account seized? Not many. Maybe if you've had an experience where you have had your bank account seized, throw it in the chat. I'm guessing we won't see anybody because uh, it just doesn't happen much. Because even if somebody does get sued, uh, you know, if it's if it's a car thing, you have automobility, uh, automobile liability. If it's a house thing, you have homeowners liability. Um, you also have certain assets like retirement accounts that are that are exempt. Nobody can take those. So, but um, on rare occasions, people get successfully sued. It's it's not like some somebody can file a lawsuit against you and then take your bank account. They have to win on the merits and uh, and get this uh, judgment that exceeds any applicable insurance limits. That you have. But anyway, making the assumption 
that your revocable living trust assets avoid creditors is false. Last false assumption that people make, and it's kind of a rookie mistake, but hey, how often do people deal in estate planning? Not very much. So uh, I applaud people for asking the questions, but they're also making some false assumptions. My last false assumption is, well, if I have a will, I'll avoid probate. So uh, some people mistakenly assume, yeah, I realize if I don't have a will, there's going to be a probate. But if I have a will, there's not going to be a probate. That assumption is false. What controls whether there's a probate when you die is if is if you have assets in your name and they're frozen, no one can get to them, no one can transfer them, no one can access an account until the survivors go through the appropriate court proceeding and the judges sign the orders ordering financial institutions, for example, to release the funds to the appropriate heirs. Um, having a having a will but leaving assets in your name uh, doesn't eliminate the probate. It's the assets in your name that require the probate, whether you have a will or not. All right, so that's number four: is all those false assumptions that people make. Now we've got two more, and actually I have a bonus couple couple of them. So hang on for that. False assumption number five is is it's failing to document your trust assets. Now, maybe when you created your trust, you created some kind of schedule that says, here's my assets or here's my assets that I'm transferring to the trust. Um, if you did get lawyer help or help to transfer your real estate to your trust, it's likely that, you know, that real estate transfer is going to be kind of attached to the trust or part of the portfolio binder of estate planning documents that you get. So it's going to be pretty easy for your successor trustee to, to determine what um, real estate is in the trust because there's some documentation that, that gets prepared and signed that says Fred and Wilma Flintstone are transferring their, their home from the name of Fred and Wilma Flintstone to Fred and Wilma as trustees of the Fred and Wilma Trust. So that's, that's pretty easy to find, but um Oftentimes, there's no there's no real schedule that a trust settlor, person who set up set up a trust, often called a settlor or grantor or trustor or trust maker. Oftentimes, the the grantor doesn't create a extensive list of trust assets that was either transferred into the trust when the trust was created, or perhaps. Um, put into the trust or acquired by the trust after the trust was created. So when you, when you don't document all of the various perhaps stock accounts, bank accounts, real estate, business interests, vehicles, when you don't document, especially if you have, you know, a, a variety of assets and, and I spoke with a gentleman yesterday, he's got, he says, I got stock accounts all over the place. And so if that if if an inventory of his assets is not prepared, uh, readily available to his successor trustee or co-trustees when he passes away, he's going to be sending that trustee on a wild goose chase um, trying to figure out, geez, what assets are in this trust that I'm having to deal with? One of the ways to combat that is in um, not trying to blow our firm's ho uh, horn, but our firm, every time we get a new client, we, we, we give them their own secure online vault account. And so everybody works together to document all of the assets. It all gets categorized, all their bank accounts, their investments, their brokerage accounts, IRAs, life insurance, all of the relevant documents that they sign, their trust, their will, their powers of attorney, healthcare documents, transfer documents, life insurance policies, all of the stuff that that successor trustee may need when the trust set law dies, it's in one secure online location. So when Fred and Wilma pass away, if Barney's the trustee, he can access that secure online vault, have every single thing that he may need to handle the settlement of Fred and Wilma's trust, won't be going on that wild goose chase. So that's number five is failing to document the trust assets. Mistake number six, believe it or not, is acting too quickly after the trust set lore dies. 
the fact that living trusts are easier to settle than wills typically, the fact that when Fred dies with a Schwab account titled in the name of his trust, that his trustee, as soon as the trustee gets the death certificate, can, can go to Schwab with Fred's death certificate with a copy of the trust, or at least the portion of the trust that says that the trustee is the trustee. If it's Barney is the trustee, Barney, maybe a week or two after Fred dies, Barney gets Fred's death certificate. He goes to Schwab with the death certificate and with the provisions of Fred's trust that show that Barney is the trustee. Schwab wants to see that before they'll release funds to Barney for ultimate distribution. But And so the, the fact that Barney can almost immediately um, disperse trust assets to the beneficiaries, it, it is a big blessing. And But it can also be a curse because um, while the trustee can, can sell assets, if, uh, if Fred had a home and Barney as the successor trustee of Fred's trust says, you know what, it would be best if we sell this home and we can disperse the proceeds to the beneficiaries. Barney could put a for sale sign in the yard the day after Fred died, find a buyer, sell the house, all done very quickly, disperse the funds. But the problem is that successor trustee still needs to see to it that Fred's final bills get paid. Fred's final income tax obligations are met. Fred's credit card bills are taken care of. Fred's funeral expenses need to be paid. And quite frankly, if Barney, after Fred dies, acts too quickly, goes and gets the money, disperses it to the beneficiaries, now Barney's in a bit of a pickle because he's really responsible for seeing all of that all of Fred's debts and bills get paid. And now he's in a pickle because he's got to go back to the beneficiaries and say, you know what, guys, I know you got your inheritance very quickly, but I need some of it back. Uh, Fred's got some bills that have to be paid. And so uh, I need you to give give back some of your inheritance so I can take care of, of Fred's final bills and expenses. That can be a really um, uncomfortable situation, both for that successor trustee and for the beneficiaries, some of whom out went out and bought a new truck and a new boat and they don't have the money anymore. So, all right. Um, so there's your six. I got more. I got a couple of more. There's your six. Let me recap them and then I'll go to the two bonus, uh, bonus mistakes. Uh, all right. So the first one was not retitling the assets. It's kind of the, if, if, if ever you look at a list of, of mistakes that people make when they uh, create their trust, number one, almost every time is they don't fund their trust. They don't retitle their assets to their trust. Number two, I said, was everything around the trustee designation because the trustee, successor trustee, doesn't act until the trust set lore dies, which could be years, decades, or a very long time after the, the trust is set up. So you have to cover some of these what ifs and all of the trustee provisions. Number three is, is over relying on the transfer or death or payable on death designations. Number four, all those various false assumptions that people make. Trust needs a tax ID not part of my taxable estate, won't have to spend the assets if I go into a nursing home, protected from my creditors. And if I have a will, it av probates avoided. All of those false, all those things that I just said, <laughs> don't believe them. I said it in the positive, but they're all incorrect assumptions. Number five, failing to document the trust assets so your successor trustee won't have to go on a wild goose chase. And number six, um, don't see it very much, but acting too quickly after the settlor dies because that ability of the successor trustee to disperse assets immediately can be a real blessing, but it can also be a curse. Now, a couple of other things, a couple of bonus ones. The first one is, you know, and my experience and the experience of many lawyers is they'll set up a trust for a married couple, Fred and Wilma Flintstone. And then uh, let's say Fred dies, or we could say Wilma dies first. Uh, I, don't, I don't mean to ignore Wilma, but um, I'm going to pick on Fred. Fred dies first. And often because there's there's no probate required, the attorney never hears from Wilma. Wilma doesn't need an attorney. Nothing's frozen that uh, Wilma can't get access to. And there's no court orders needed to gain access to anything because things are in the living trust. And now that Fred has died, Wilma is the sole 
trustee. So oftentimes there is no attorney involvement when the first spouse dies after married couples have set up either a joint trust or have set up separate trusts. And which is great. <laughs> Who wants to deal with attorneys, right? Um, but if if Fred had a will plan and he left everything in his name and he died, Wilma would be forced in most cases to hire an attorney to, to handle Fred's probate. And maybe if she did hire an attorney after Fred died, that attorney might be able to pick up on the fact that that there may be some tax issues that need to be addressed. Maybe if Wilma does consult with an attorney after Fred dies, that attorney might say, based on the value of Fred's estate and the value of Wilma's estate, the attorney might tell Wilma, hey, Wilma, you should file a federal estate tax return, IRS Form 706, because Fred didn't use all of his estate tax exclusion amount. And we could file an estate tax return and add Fred's unused estate tax exclusion amount to your estate tax exclusion amount when you die, significantly increasing, Wilma, how much you can leave to your heirs free of the 40% estate tax when you die. So when a couple has a, a living trust, there often, quite frankly, isn't any kind of uh, attorney involvement when the first spouse dies because the surviving spouse thinks they don't need it, nothing's frozen, but sometimes it, it, it may be appropriate to file a federal estate tax return and make that portability election because Fred's estate tax exemption is portable and, and Wilma could use it in the future. So that's another potential mistake is failing to make the portability election when the first spouse dies. My, my final mistake that people make is, um, is, you know, the whole idea behind the living trust is, boy, I, I sure would like to make it easy. I want it to be smooth. I want there don't, I don't want there to be any delay. I want to, you know, all those, that's, that's all the stuff that's said about the living trust. Um, however, if you are setting up a living trust and you know somebody's going to be a jerk, maybe one of those beneficiaries, maybe one of those trustees, then um, particularly the beneficiaries, perhaps putting that no contest clause into your trust can make it go very seamless because now with that no contest clause in your trust, that beneficiary who is thinking about being a jerk, and we could define what being a jerk is, uh, not cooperating with anyone, not signing things that need to be signed to get things done, then um, uh, or or that beneficiary who might you know contest the the pro a provision of the trust, and when they do, then you know then now we're talking delay and expense and all that problem. So if you know somebody's going to be a jerk, or maybe if you don't know anybody's going to be a jerk, putting that no contest clause in the living trust may just give that potential jerk some incentive. Hey, look, I'm going to cooperate here. I don't want to do anything to jeopardize my million dollar inheritance that I'm about to get. I'm, uh, I'm good is what that potential jerk says, because if the jerk, and I, I probably shouldn't use the term jerk, but I'm using it anyway, because I, I just like to be blunt and you get the picture. Um, if they do contest something, they risk losing their million dollar inheritance. So that's a little bonus. Bonus number one, failing to make the portability election when the first spouse dies. Bonus number two is perhaps failing to insert a no contest clause, particularly if you know somebody's just going to be uncooperative. All right. So what I want to do now is we're going to head over to the chat. We've got a good crowd and we got some good chat going. I've been seeing it uh, going around. As always, as I scroll up to the top of the chat, the first one I see is my man, Larry. So uh, good to have Larry here. And uh, and then we've got New Jersey and uh, New North Carolina. We got my man, Jimbo, who uh, who I know. Good to see you on again. Got Rita for also from North Carolina. Got one of my favorites, Ann, from Tennessee. Maybe that's what the T-E is for. Um and then in New Jersey, which is faster payout to beneficiaries, providing all beneficiaries are named properly in a will, a will or a living trust. Uh, you know, every estate settlement is different, but I would say in general, uh, the trust is going to be faster 
because you didn't really say what kind of accounts, that's okay. Let's say you have an account at a brokerage firm at, and I used Schwab as an example, I could use Fidelity, Vanguard, all the others. Um, if you have a trust account at Schwab and you pass away, then your successor trustee in your trust will need your death certificate. Really, that's it. Um, and a copy of the trust, which they'll have. And that's what Schwab needs. And, and that usually happens within maybe two or three weeks of somebody passing away. Whereas if, if the person who died, their account was in their name and they had a will naming an executor and naming heirs, now the will has to go through a court process. Judges have to declare the will valid. Judges have to sign court orders, uh, giving the executor the authority to act. And that typically takes a lot longer than it takes for a successor trustee to access a trust account. Cheshire Cat, hello to you. Like the heart. Um, Alabama. Hey, there you go. Okay. Um, Roseanne, hello from Florida. Good to see Florida, one of my favorite states. And feel like a family here. You know, I, you couldn't have said it better myself. You got Larry, you got Ann, you got Jimbo, you got all these people. We'll have to have some kind of reunion um, live stream at some point. So from College Station, Texas, home of the Aggies. Hello, Living Will. Hello, Living Will Trust set up and funded. Crypt, crypt paid for funeral service, paid for it. Good. Sounds like you... Uh, you're well on your way, if not already there, to making things easy for your loved ones. Congratulations. Patrick Gary says, what's up? My name is Gary Joseph Osborne. What I'm trying to do is to free my name from corporate identity. The straw man needs to go away. Good luck with that. I'm, I'm not really in the business of making people invisible. Um, that's um, really a little out of my wheelhouse. I've been through probate, Rita says, on several estates. A family member seems the smaller estates are more... I've always said that, Rita. Great, great minds think alike, Rita. It seems like when somebody, you know, they die and they have ninety thousand dollars of assets and it needs to be distributed twelve different ways. It seems, for whatever reason, that seems to be a nightmare probate, where you know, if you have a million dollars and it's going to be divided seven different ways, it's like no problem. So that that's a it's not a hard and fast rule that way, but I've always said, Rita, that the smaller estates are more difficult to settle than the larger ones. And my mother had a trust when she passed away. I just stepped in. So easy, no attorney involved. <clears throat> Great to hear, Ann. Tor Ekman, what's with the influx bra? Don't even have any idea what you're talking about. Uh Sunny, Illinois, Gary, what's Aunt Leanne doing? I don't know. Larry, my parents died within a year and had a living revocable trust and helped not having to go through the probate process. Initially, we didn't fully understand the trust and have it fully funded. All right. Thanks for the experience there, Larry. Hello from Virginia, says Teddy Fan 2. Uh, will divorce force you to dissolve a trust even if one party wants to keep their assets in a living trust? Good question. And when a couple sets up a, div uh, a living trust and then they get divorced, First thing you have to do is is look at the trust instrument. The trust instrument instrument might say if if there is a divorce, then the then the trust gets terminated and the husband's assets get transferred back to the husband and the wife's assets get transferred back to the wife. So it all depends on what the trust instrument provides. So you have to look at the trust and. Um, so yeah, if they get divorced, uh, it either perhaps would get transferred to each spouse's living trust or transferred back to the spouses and then the spouses could create their own living trust moving forward. Austin, you're welcome. You're learning. Great. That's the whole idea here. And when the trustee step down, then the next of kin or lone survivor will be the one that takes over. Not necessarily. It all depends on the trust instrument. So when the trustees step down, you go back to the trust. Is, is there a backup mechanism in place? If there is, then that's who becomes the trustee. If there's not, then you have to see in the trust um, what happens if there is a vacancy in the office of trustee and you have to follow that language if it exists. And like I mentioned earlier, if there aren't provisions in the trust to provide for what happens in the event of a vacancy in the office of trustee, sometimes you have to get lawyers and courts involved, which we want to try to avoid. All right, DKS, my two grown daughters won't be my trustee for no reason what to do. So um, uh, if your two daughters won't be your successor trustee, then you have to select another trustee, which would either be one or more other individuals or some corporate 
trust company, all the large brokerage firms, financial institutions, I say all of them, but you'll have to check. They all have their own trust company. And so um, if you wanted to go that route, you could. So that's an option. Larry, how often do banks not know how to set up a living trust checking account a year after having set up a trust checking account and POA approval? Wells Fargo suggested it and <laughs> confused my mind. Uh, yeah, it's it's uh, it's, it's a challenge. Um, so, you know, you're talking about when the bank knows or doesn't know, and then you you have to look at the particular employees of the bank that you're talking to versus other employees of the bank who may have more or less information and may be more or less knowledgeable on how all of this stuff works. So there's there's just a standard if you're if you're going to deal with a financial institution with a with a will with a power of attorney with a trust uh, expect some challenges that you'll have to overcome because banks have their own policies and then bank employees seem to have their own uh, way that they think things should happen. So good point. And retitled is so important. Thanks for the emphasis there. And some banks don't like POA. True. And we mentioned that earlier and says hi to Larry, which I really like and, and gives Larry, I, I'm offended. Now Larry's getting the wavy hands and I thought I was the only one, but uh, Larry's getting them too. No, I'm joking. That's fantastic. The more people can get wavy, happy hands, the better in this world today. Roseanne, what is POS? Uh, I don't know. Don't know what you're referring to. You may be referring to POD, but if somebody knows what POS is and that Roseanne's referring to, throw it in the chat. Oh, POA, you're correcting yourself. Power of attorney. One thing we haven't talked about much at all on these live streams is power of appointment. And I don't want to get into power of appointment. That's another live stream. But when I see POA, POA, I'm typically thinking power of attorney where, Roseanne, you might sign a power of attorney that authorize, authorizes someone that you trust to be able to transact for you during your lifetime. And it's usually used if you ever get sick or injured or ill and you can't sign your name and you can't deal with your accounts. If you have a power of attorney, the person that you designated to be your agent or attorney, in fact, in your power of attorney can then transact for you without having to go through a court proceeding. Have you declared incompetent? Have a judge appoint a legal guardian? So the power of attorney, typically the, the goal over there is to avoid that guardianship proceeding. You're welcome, Roseanne. And yes, sorry. Thanks. Uh, good stuff there. Like the happy, uh, happy hands and the hearts. All good. Hi, Paul. You said earlier that successor trustees need to deposit check to a trust account. Did you mean the trustees account or a new trust account? So I think I think what you're referring to um, YouTube with lots of capital and non-capital letters is uh, I may have been referring to Fred Flintstone died. He had a trust. Um, he named Barney as the successor trustee. Fred dies. Barney's now the trustee. Barney can sell the house. And um and when he does sell the house, the check at the closing is payable to the Fred Flintstone Trust. There may already be an account titled that way, or maybe Barney would have to go set up a new trust checking account at the bank that he will serve as the trustee over. That's the kind of account that Barney would deposit a the proceeds from the sale of a trust asset into. Hope that answers your question. MK, corporate trustees info from the web. Excellent. Yep. Good point there. And you're welcome. Stay with Paul. I didn't know anything. Good. Uh, thanks. And normal ranges tend to be somewhere. But yeah, I, I, I didn't want to mention that, but you did. And I'm glad you did, MK. Corporate trustee compensation, 1% to 1.5% of the estate value. The larger the estate, the lower percentage. That's all very accurate. Some firms also charge a minimum annual fee. Yeah, you might imagine the corporate trustees, they want to handle the big money. They don't just want to handle a $75,000 trust because if you apply the percentages to it, they're not making enough money. So they have a minimum. So all good points there. Um, but they, uh, um, again, I'm, these corporate trustees are starting to grow on me just because they tend to do a professional job. They do all the accounting. They do file all the taxes. Um, so it's just an option. Be aware of it. Uh, Larry, Paul gets confused. Also every L he, uh, <laughs> I'm reading things fast. Larry, sorry about that. Larry, you're always on my mind. And so when I see an L, I think Larry, okay. LD, not LB. I think I saw an LB. 
All right. So great. Uh, hi, Paul. When y'all are making me laugh, when debts are being paid out of the trust, are the IRA or life insurance in danger of being used? No. Uh, again, tip, unless the life insurance and IRA are payable to the estate, um, then they are subject to the creditors of the estate or creditors of the trust, perhaps. But uh, generally, it's those probate assets, you know, the bank accounts and the IRA, the life insurance, it just gets it's paid to beneficiaries directly and um, typically aren't subject to the debts of the deceased person or IRA owner or life insurance insured. I was on my mother's POD, just went to bank with us. Very good. See, uh, POD is a great thing. It's, I'm just I'm glad they have it. It makes it easier for people. Um, just got to be used correctly. In, in your case, and it was. So fantastic. Sue, I don't want anything to do with him. Not sure who him is. Hope it's not me. Haven't hit the like button. Couldn't agree with you more. Haven't hit the like button. That helps. In fact, I just surpassed, I think last night, the 270,000 subscribers. So let's keep it going. Subscribing lets you put stuff in the chat. Uh, just at the link. Boy, we got a lot of chat here. AJ, thanks for all. And I, I talk fast because I don't want you to feel like we're wasting time. Thanks for all you do and sharing your knowledge. Wish I had you as my lawyer. You could. All you have to do is go into the um, description of the video and request a an estate planning design meeting. And who knows, one day we may be talking in the near future. I'm meeting with my new lawyer next week. He was referred to be my, my dear friend, my financial advisor. Good. So um, Frank, message retracted. Chuck, do you recommend a legal review after the first spouse dies? No, can't hurt. So um, for, for the reasons that I explained, sometimes there's things that should be done or are required to be done when the first spouse dies. It may not require a probate, but it may require some some moves that could be made to ultimately save tax dollars down the road. So not a bad idea to get a review when the first spouse dies. Frank, what if we did get an EIN when setting up the RLT? Mm, you probably just maybe confuse the IRS. It, it doesn't change um, the the tax responsibility the income still just gets reported on your personal return, but you just don't need to get an EIN. Read a fee schedule for North Carolina to be trustee. If you want a corporate trustee to handle annual fee, 1.3% on first million of assets and trust fees go down. Excellent feedback, Rita. Thanks for checking on that and, and forwarding that. Sun rain. I don't want anything to do with it moving forward. That's what's best for me. No one has problem, but I don't really understand what's going on here. Uh, Mike, can I give my wife power of appointment over my trust? So when I pass away, she has the right to make changes to it. Yes, you can. Um, and thank you, Paul, for answering important questions for me. You're welcome. And uh, I'll always answer questions for you. And when you if you keep doing the wavy hands and the emoji with the hearts, how could I not answer those questions. Uh, YouTube in the process of finishing my trust with a lawyer. What should I do if my trust lawyer is unresponsive or unwilling to help? Not a good sign. So um, uh, so you finished with the lawyer and it just depends whether because they're non-responsive or unwilling to help. It, it, it kind of depends on whether you should get another attorney relationship, whether you feel that's necessary so, but that would be the next step if, if for some reason you, you feel like that, um, you know, if your lawyer is unresponsive or unwilling to help, that leads me to believe that you need a lawyer who responds to whatever inquiry you have or you're looking for help. So that probably means you need to establish another kind of attorney relationship. And that, that's kind of unfortunate because obviously you paid attorney fees to somebody to get all this set up for you. And Typically, as part of that engagement, the lawyer is typically willing to provide some follow-up advice, follow-up help, just as part of you know what you incurred in legal expense. But now you got to go get somebody else who you haven't hired and haven't paid, and they're not going to be crazy about just uh, reviewing an old trust and then uh, answering your questions. So maybe that's why it's so important to get it right from the get-go. You're welcome. Uh, uh, oh, uh, hey, I like that name. Just Oh, um, MK, thank you so much for these videos. Learning so much. Paid taxes after death and said, Poppy Weasel, I'm just late. Mm, okay, does that mean you were sleeping with your emoji there? And hi, hi, Pippi. All right, is there, did I, oh, Poppy. Pip, I see Poppy Weasel and Anne says hi, Pippi. Pip, Pippi, okay. 
MK, it will be great to have a list of which assets should be put in the trust and which one should not. I agree. Um, ads galore, Paul Stanks. Okay, DKS, that's that's YouTube. Um, YouTube controls all that ad stuff. For the love of all that holy, please make sure people know not to name minor children as the beneficiary of anything. Name the trust and let the trust distribute it. Yeah. So good, uh, excellent response there, Kevin. Maybe I should have thrown that into the TOD, POD stuff. Don't name minors. Name the trust because the trust will provide for any assets left to minors will remain in trust until they're older. So it won't be dumped into their laps on the 18th birthday. I've been in insurance and and court hell getting financial guardianship for my kids because mom left insurance. Oh, <laughs> you have been likely been through some oh, some court messes because your mother, bless, uh, bless your mother, she left assets to your children who are minors. And uh, yeah, um, insurance companies won't pay out to minors. Um, they'll pay out to the court appointed guardian of the minor. And just, and, and even though there's a parent of the minor, you still have to go through court and get a court appointed guardian. So thank you for sharing that experience, Kevin. Uh, hopefully many people can learn from it. You're welcome, Texas lady. Uh, capital equipment that is not titled how to include these in the trust. Typically, if you have them non-titled capital equipment, personal items, furniture, jewelry, a four-wheeler, you, know, uh, you can sign something that says I'm you know, transferring all these personal effects to my trust, but you don't have to get that registered anywhere because things aren't titled. And there's a couple of different ways to handle the personal effects. There's, depending on what state you're in, there's something called a tangible personal property mem memorandum if you want to leave personal items to certain people. Flower Temple Select, there's a new name. Kevin, my elderly mother and minor child are being held captive. The judge had already been reported to the bar, fiduciary attorney or probate attorney, same thing. I think this judge had me attacked. Oh boy, maybe I ought to have you as a guest Flower Temple Select on a live stream so you could share that story. Uh, let's see here, we're almost, we're wrapping up here. What about POD transfers to another state when the bank is lying, saying you must walk in, has already transferred me out? Yeah. Uh, so you're talking about a scam thing. I kind of hate to even go there because I'm just answering stuff quickly. You're welcome, Ann. Well, oh, uh, okay. I won't repeat what Flower Temple select. I was a bad word. Uh, wow. If there's a trust being hid. Okay. So uh, you're welcome, Jimbo. Look forward to talking to you next week. I know we have something scheduled. All right. Um, corporate trust DKS says charge $5 minimum. Congratulations. You're welcome. Uh, thank you, Austin. Been a lot of work. I didn't even know what a subscriber was. A uh, funny story. When I, when I first started making videos back in, or I think it was 2016, I was making videos for one reason and one reason only because I was tired of answering the same questions over and over again. If I had a nickel for every time somebody asked me, Paul, What's the difference between a will and a trust? Paul, what's a power of attorney? Paul, what's the difference between a revocable and irrevocable trust? If I, I have been asked those questions thousands of times, finally, I was like, I'm going to make a video and I'm going to answer those questions on, an, on a video. So when so-and-so asks me, you know, uh, what powers does somebody have if they've been given power of attorney? I can just send them to my six or seven minute video where I, it's a well thought out, maybe even scripted response that covers everything the person would want to hear. That's why I started making YouTube videos. And I, I think after one year I had seven, um, seven subscribers to my channel. So I've got a wife and five kids. I think that was six of my subscribers uh, in my first year. And then it just, um, maybe I got a little better at making the videos and maybe some, you know, not maybe, but maybe some people started contacting me. Paul, can you help me? I watched your video. You said things in a way that I could, exp I could understand them. Will you help me? And so I was like, I think I may have something going on here. And so um, ever since then, I've made over 700 videos, um, you know, and as a result, formed a national estate planning law firm, mainly as a result of this YouTube channel. channel. So thank all of you for being subscribers. Uh, uh, participating in, the, in this journey of mine. All right. So uh, let's see here. Stay safe. AJ Tom, I'm going to try to stay safe. Um, 
because the IRS does not care who pays taxes as long as it gets paid. Maybe there's some truth to that, Poppy. It depends on what the circumstances are. Uh, oh, you'll have the copy. You'll come on the show next Friday. Okay, Flower Temple. Maybe we'll have to uh, make that happen. My, my problem is I'm technologically challenged. I got to figure out how to use Zoom and have multiple people on one of these live streams, but I know it's easy. Austin must drive you nuts like the doctor who gets asked everything. <laughs> yeah, and uh, thank you, Austin. Uh, and we are glad you, I am, I'm glad too, and I'm glad you're watching them. Um, Paul, thanks. Yeah, you're, you're welcome. Heaven. Oh, one You're you're heavenly saying what you're saying. It's just, I'm blessed to be a part of this and Texas lady says a great. All right. So that'll do it. Uh, you know, for those of you who are still live, look, I don't know what I'm going to do next week. Uh, I, I scheduled six or seven of the six in a row. I did them all. This was number six in a row, night after night after night. Uh, I got to go back to the drawing board, figure out the best way to use my time, live streams, other just recorded videos that I put up, other um, applications that I can use to educate educate people. But I know I'm going to continue educating. In fact, if you have a suggestion on how you like to consume this stuff, live stream, shorts, long form video that's recorded. I'll leave the chat open for a couple of minutes. Feel free to throw your suggestions and maybe what have I done or what have others done to to enable you to become informed so that you can make more informed and educated decisions. All right. So with that being said, everybody have a great weekend. And even if I end the live, live stream, I think that you can continue in the chat if you want to. We'll see you next time.